Are you connected? Is I think it that's just right. not ready yet? I think you just, just hit join audio, I think. Join what? Audio. Plus, no, that one makes you go to your something else. Oh, this and then computer hits, audio is already connected. And then hit the start video at the bottom left hand. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Think you're okay for yeah. it? Yeah. Come get me if you need me. Thank you. All right, we're going to be getting started here with our virtual town hall in a moment. We have, we don't have it recorded on um, if we could have everybody, as you guys come on to the call or the, your computer, if you would please hit the mute button at the bottom of your screen. Oh, lovely. <clears throat> I'm sorry, how do you hit mute if you're on the phone? Um, you won't, if you're on the phone, you won't have the mute option. You'll just have to be quiet. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> My ring doorbell may sound every once in a while, though. <laughs> oh, that's right. It just makes it hard for, you know, to, to hear if, if there's tons of noise going on in the background. But I, I know. I know. Do what you can, you'll be fine. Okay, I'll be quiet. <laughs> We're just going to give it a, a few minutes here to let everybody kind of load on and come on. There's a wasp right in front of my face. Okay, and as you come as on, you come please on. hit the mute button on the bottom of your screen. 
We'll be getting started here in a few minutes. Is there a presentation with this? Because I can't log into this Zoom thing. Um, we do have, the, there'll be a few slides um, as Representative Singer speaks, um, but we will make those available. We're gonna record this. Um, so they will be available once we're done here. And, we and will, will we be able to ask questions? You will be able to ask questions towards the, um, the end and I'll let you know when we open up the floor to questions. Um, if you're on the phone, we, we ask that you just um, give us some, I guess, some time to work through. We've got a lot of questions coming in on different format platforms. Um, if you're on the computer and you'd like to ask a question once we get to that point, um, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, there's a chat option. We're asking that um, this is how you will send in your questions to me is through your chat option. And again, if you're just coming on, if you could please hit your mute button, we would appreciate it. Okay, folks, you give it about another minute for folks to get logged on, then we'll get started. This is Jonathan Singer, by the way, on the phone. Okay, it's about 1.02 p.m. Um, we are recording this, so for folks who miss part of this, definitely, once again, this is State Representative Jonathan Singer. Um, as a quick reminder, uh, for those of you who are logging on via computer, if you want to um, mute yourself, and also, if for bandwidth purposes, it's also helpful. If you want to leave your video on, that's fine. Um, we'd love to see what you're eating for lunch and maybe get some new ideas in this era of social distancing. But um, if you want to turn off your video screen, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here, uh, especially our folks from the Chamber of Commerce for taking the time to put this together, um, as well as um, the, um, our regional director from the Small Business Administration. Once again, um, if you can all set things to mute, if um, you haven't done that already, I'm seeing more and more mute buttons go up. So good work over there. All right, um, so Scott um, from the uh, Longmont Chamber of Commerce, I know that you're on a tight time frame as well as our regional administrator, um, former representative Dan Nordberg. So I'm gonna let Scott jump into this right away unless uh, unless any of our other presenters have anything else um, right now and otherwise um, Scott take it away all right thank you representative singer appreciate your uh, time and I'll be quick here and then I'll jump off but we do have several other uh, chamber staff on the call today so if anybody has questions about what's talked about today you can talk to the chamber or representative singer's office uh, so I know we have Jessica Carson and Jessica Wanasek with the uh, Chamber Office on the call today too. But I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, today. I want to especially thank Representative Singer for his time, his leadership, and also his concern for uh, the employees of our Longmont businesses. Um, and I want to uh, thank uh, Hannah Light in his office and Jessica Wanasek in our office here at the Chamber for arranging this and putting this all together. Um, so thank you to those uh, two ladies. At the Longmont Chamber, we understand that you, um, as the employees, are an integral part of our business community. Uh, in fact, um, people are the most important part of any business. I want to let you know a little bit about what the Longmont Chamber of Commerce is doing. The Longmont Chamber is part of the Advanced Longmont Partnership, and uh, we partner with the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, the Downtown Development Authority, Visit Longmont, 
Workforce Boulder County, the City of Longmont, the Small Business Development Center. And we are meeting uh, daily to strategize and plan a path forward and work with our state and our local officials to help businesses and all employees. And we want to see our businesses be successful and we want to see you uh, employee. Um, so what we've done is we put together a coordinated resource hub. So if you check out monlot.org forward slash COVID-19, I believe we'll have that website up on the screen at some point, and I'll repeat it. It's longmont.org forward slash COVID-19. And on that website, you can see a lot of resources <laughs> for businesses and also for employees. And what we've just recently started to add, um, and this list will grow, um, but what we've just recently added is a list of companies that are hiring. So if you are out of work right now and you are looking, uh, are some positions that would uh, be a good fit for you. Uh, these are challenging times for our community. And I've had a number of conversations with business owners and employees who are concerned about their incomes, their families, and their future. But we are going to get through this together. And one of the ways we're gonna do that is through leadership. And so that's why I'm particularly um, pleased that Representative Singer has joined us today. Um, and so I would ask you that, to listen to his uh, responses to your questions and listen to what he has to say. He's here to help you and answer your questions. But also he's going to be listening to what you're saying. Um, and so the information that you uh, text or chat in your questions um, he's going to take that back and he's going to work with his fellow legislators. He's going to work with all the departments of the st at the state level and our governor's office. And in that way, they're going to work together to do what's best for Coloradans. And so please uh, look at this as an entire conversation. Uh, learn from him, but also know that he's going to take the information back to better help you. So thank you again for joining us today. I hope you get a lot out of this. Um, we are planning to do probably more of these. Um, so stay tuned and also check out, uh, again, longmont.org forward slash COVID hyphen 19 for more information. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Scott, for that. I'm going to jump straight to uh, our regional director, Dan Nordberg, right now. Um, and thank you, everyone, once again, for, for keeping yourselves on mute. If you're on the phone, you'll have to use your mute button on the phone on, well, your cell phone, unless you're dialing from a rotary phone, in which case, congratulations on keeping that. All right, uh, Dan, um, thank you again for joining us. I know you're exceptionally busy. I know there's a huge federal package that's already been passed and there's another one that's coming down the pipeline, but please um, share with us what you have and uh, let us know um, what else we can be doing. Great, thank you, Representative Singer, and thanks for your leadership in facilitating this. I'm, I'm glad to be here. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about, as Representative Singer referenced, We've heard about the congressional package going through at this time, but do want to make you all aware of a, another congressional action that took place two weeks ago. Um, Congress passed what was the legislation was HR 6401. That is the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriation Act. And a la that legislative vehicle, Congress authorized the Small Business Administration to utilize our economic injury disaster loans for businesses who have been adversely impacted by coronavirus. Now for context, this loan program is traditionally what we use for, uh, to help communities recover from wildfires, disasters, uh, you know, you name it, tornadoes, really natural events. This is historic for us in that it's the first time SBA is responding to a biological event, uh, a pandemic. So over the past two weeks, we have been working with we have been working diligently with states all over the country, um, including here in Colorado. And I certainly want to commend if there's anybody from the Office of Economic Development on the line, as well as our SBDC network partners for the work that they did in helping declare S uh, Colorado an SBA disaster, because that allowed us the opportunity to bring in these economic injury loans. And it was a very prescribed process, and the team here in Colorado did a fantastic job. So I'd be remiss if I did not say thank you to them. Now that, these, now that these economic injury loans are available, what does that entail? Who are these eligible for? 
So the economic injury disaster loan is up to $2 million of assistance per small business, as well as for private nonprofits. They can be utilized to pay fixed debts, um, payroll, accounts payable, and really any other bill that would have been paid if the disaster not, had not impacted that business. In terms of the interest rate for that product, it's 3.75% for small businesses, and it's 2.75% for nonprofits. In terms of the repayment schedule, um, it can go out to 30 years. So the term is, is certainly, I think, friendly in that regard. But also, it's important to note for anyone thinking about this product or any organization may be listening, that terms are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. I will say that this product, while we've had authorization for just two weeks um, to utilize it, we are already having thousands of people apply through the web online application portal. Um, you can find that application site at sba.gov forward slash disaster, sba.gov forward slash disaster. Um, I am going to preface with two things. That website is currently down for maintenance right now, unfortunately. We're dealing with just nationwide bandwidth issues and we need to get it addressed. So we're just doing that right now. It's being done as fast as possible. I'm hopeful we'll be back on by tonight. The other thing I wanna make sure I preface is that the congressional action going through today, we've all heard about this huge package that's gonna be coming about. It's very important to note that there are likely going to be changes to the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program that will be probably more favorable to the consumer once that language is passed. So it's important to keep an eye on it. Certainly we're gonna be, we're gonna be communicating that information as it becomes available to us. And that's why these forms are so valuable. So stay tuned. I, I will also give another teaser that we have a flagship loan program that many small business owners utilize called the 7A loan program. We fully expect that that is gonna be altered um, in a relatively drastic manner to better help small businesses and consumers alike. So stay tuned. We'll probably have more information in the coming weeks, but uh, Representative Singer, if, if time permits, I'd be glad to answer any questions that uh, individuals may have. I'm taking, a, <coughs> excuse me, taking myself off of mute right now. So um, since, um, since we do have uh, Mr. Norberg, former Representative Norberg here, um, are there, um, I'll actually go to Jessica. Did we have any questions for, for the SBA that were uh, already previously sent to us? Um, yeah, sorry, I was just hitting mute on. Well, um, let me see what we, we did get um, a few questions, but. And these are for the SBA, is that what we're looking for? That is correct, yes. A lot of these are all just really generalized questions. So Dan, are you able to hang on until we get to the question section or do you regrettably, have to I, I, Regrettably, I have about five to 10 more minutes tops. I, and I apologize, I just have another webinar I'm doing. So uh, I I'm, just uh, uh, put a question in the chat. Yeah, Laura, I'm going to go to your question in the chat right now, um, and I'm going to repeat it uh, for everyone who may not be able to see the chat. Um, great question, by the way, from Laura McDonald. If you get a loan from uh, a bank, will it impact what is available to you from a federal program? So if you get a loan from a bank, can funds from a federal program be used to repay that bank loan if the federal program has better terms and rates? Okay, Laura, that's a great question. And, and this is something that's been brought up. I don't wanna to get too technical, um, but I referenced the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. I also referenced what's known as our 7A Loan Program, which is really a working capital program that SBA administers. There has been some question, and I think we're waiting to see in terms of what Congress does, whether or not people can utilize both programs or if there'll be a penalty for utilizing both programs. Um, that is an outstanding question that I don't know. Also, under our existing standards, if you already are utilizing an SBA loan product, that can prohibit you from utilizing another SBA loan product or some of our emergency, even our economic emergency loans. So we're all anxiously awaiting to see what Congress does with that standard. I can tell you right now, just based on what we're hearing 
and based on what we're seeing, um, they really are giving us a lot of authority and they're trying to relax those standards so that we can just do whatever we can to, to eliminate the red tape and just help businesses. But um, I'd be happy to talk to you more offline about that, Laura, but we are still waiting further guidance. Any, uh, any, any follow-up from Laura on that one or any other questions, uh, Jessica? Uh, there was one that came in and it says, given the severe impact of mandatory closures on small business tenants, has the legislature contemplated a moratorium on evictions for commercial tenancies related to the pandemic? Without some protection in place, small businesses in particular will be forced to close leading to more layoffs if some kind of protections are not in place. So uh, I'm going to try and tackle that one and I'm going to put that my, in my parking lot as I'm doing my presentation, but is federally speaking, um, you know, Dan, have you heard or seen anything in the new relief package that would be putting any kind of moratorium on um, mortgages, uh, rents, foreclosures, anything like that? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, no, I have not at the federal level heard of any language that would do that. Um, you know, I think a lot of what we're trying to do or from what I've seen from at least the small business standpoint of this legislation is making sure that we have the working capital available to small businesses who need it during this difficult time. Um, I will say I'm hearing components of, of the loan programs and various things to do just that, that would forgive parts of the loan if it's used for payroll and those things to keep employees on staff. So I know that doesn't really pertain to the tenant question and, and some of the lease questions, the moratorium that was referenced, but you know, this package from a federal standpoint, they're certainly trying to do everything they can to make sure business owners have the capital they need as well as the flexibility to survive during this uncertainty. All right, any other questions for, um, for Mr. Norberg before we move on with our presentation? And like I said, I will get back to that during, during my component, but I don't wanna preempt other folks. Um, if not, all right, Dan, if you wanna stick on for a couple of minutes, you're more than welcome to. Um, I'm looking at the ch Zoom chat just to make sure there's no other questions I'm seeing here. Um, I'll give one more half beat of a second for people to take themselves off of mute if there's a question for a federal small business administration. Hey, I, I do have one question. Um, is in that uh, economic injury and that that disaster loan, does it allow them to pay their contract employees as well? small businesses to pay their cut. Yeah. I mean, so you can utilize that loan. So if, if the contractor employees are for payroll as part of your normal payroll, and you would have made that, um, you would have been able to make that payment had it not the coronavirus occurred. I think that would be allowable use of that fund. I will say too, that our underwriting standards are changing frequently on that mm -hmm. economic injury program. So they're giving, they're trying whatever we can do internally from a regulatory standpoint, as well as what Congress is going to authorize us to do. We'll certainly have a better picture in the coming days. Yeah. But to me, yes, that would be an eligible use of that program. Okay, thank you. So just one other follow-up just to the, to the question since it's hot off the presses. Um, I know some other folks are, are watching online right now um, and are texting me. Um, there is a federal bill called the Rental Eviction Moratorium Act. This would prevent eviction, uh, of, excuse me, pro prohibit evictions during this pandemic. Um, and Congressman Nagus supports it and has called for its passage. We'll try and put links up um, on the Facebook event um, as well as um, uh, if folks got this email from, from me already, I'll try and pr uh, give new updates uh, in the next 24 hours to questions that either we didn't have full answers for or, or getting you answers for. Um, but with that, um, Dan, I'm gonna let you take off and, and head to your next thing. Thank you, I know you're incredibly busy across the region, not just across Colorado, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. No, thank you, thank you, Representative Singer. And if there are questions that come up throughout the, the conversation, please don't hesitate to email them to me and we'll get people a response. 
All right. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to move uh, next to our State Department of Labor. Um, I know the intention here was not only to talk about small businesses, but really um, I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce and their membership for really wanting to make this about employees and what services employees can get um, from our state and federal government as well as their locals. And so I know we have Patrick Teagarden here with uh, a, a number of other folks. And so I'm hoping that folks have, have made it on. I believe we have um, Daniel Chase and um, uh, executive uh, and, and maybe somebody else. I apologize. That's going to be my technical difficulty for today. So if our friends from Department of Labor want to take themselves off of mute and, and share what they have, uh, feel free to jump in. Thank you, Representative Singer. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, this is Daniel Chase, uh, Chief of Staff to our Executive Director, Joe Barella. Pat had to step onto a different phone call. We're kind of stretched thin on phone calls right now. Um, but I'm sitting here with Angela Fannin-Steel, who's our Director of Policy in our Unemployment Insurance Division, um, to answer any questions there. But just to give a brief overview on what we're up to, um, as you guys have probably seen in the media, we're pretty heavily focused on ramping up our Unemployment Insurance Division to handle the mass influx of claims that we've gotten. Um, we're seeing about a 1,500% increase um, from before uh, the um, work from home measures were implemented um, at the governor and at the local levels. Um, at this point, we are accepting claims online through coloradoui.gov. Uh, we were having some pretty significant technical difficulties with that website up until um, this week, I won't say it's all fixed, but we are at a point where we're accepting a, a ton more claims now, um, and that website should be uh, pretty functional at this point. Uh, in terms of employer services, we are continuing to push out um, our uh, unemployment insurance division's work share program. Uh, it's a program that partners with the business so that instead of having to lay off a portion or all of your workforce, uh, you can set up an, uh, essentially an agreement with our unemployment insurance division that would um, do it so that instead of laying off that workforce, you would reduce their hours at work, uh, and then the work the the employer would pay for those hours that they're working, and then our unemployment insurance division would pick up the remaining hours um, with unemployment insurance. So that then uh, the advantage there is you don't have to lose your retained workforce; you can retain those ones that are um, knowledgeable. Um, and um, that, are, that are ones that are experienced at their jobs. So we're pushing that uh, information for employers. You can always call 303-318-9100. That's our employer line. Um, and then employees, uh, we always encourage them to call our 303-318-9000 number uh, for unemployment insurance. Uh, the other side of things that we've been working on are uh, our wage and hour division, or our um, division of labor standards and statistics, uh, worked on promulgating emergency rules um, to compel employers that are in certain industries that are at higher risk of transmitting uh, the virus to provide uh, four days of paid sick leave to their employees if they're showing symptoms. That's to encourage uh, those employees to make sure there aren't barriers to them staying at home. We want to make sure our not spreading that virus is our top priority and, and uh, taking away barriers is, is, um, is what we're focused on. So those are our two main efforts right now. Um, we also just yesterday pr uh, promulgated some emergency rules in our workers' comp division to reduce the need for paperwork and in-person um, interaction um, with our division as you're going through that process. So I'll just leave it there and open it up to questions if that's good for you, Representative Singer. That's great. Um, Jessica, I'm gonna hop to you again. Do we have questions that, um, that have been pre-submitted that we can ask to our State Department of Labor? Yep, let me just double check here. We've got a list going. Um, there's one. How are you addressing the impact to businesses like mine who have already had to lay off 30% or more of their workforce? Uh, through the through the Department of Labor, unfortunately, in terms of impact to businesses, we don't have many options through us. We're we're um, partnering with our Office of Economic Development and International Trade and the Small Business Administration that you heard from earlier to. Uh, work with those businesses to um, try to try to figure out things like WorkShare that may be able to help reduce their costs a little bit more, but not uh, do full layoffs. Okay, and then um, here's another one. It says, if a full-time employee has lost their job and had to get a temporary job, are, there, are they now ineligible to receive benefits? 
So um, my initial reaction is that if they received a reduction in hours, um, they would likely uh, qualify for benefits, but I'm going to turn that over to Angela who can answer that more in depth. Hi, the requirements for um, receiving unemployment insurance is that a worker has to be um, working fewer than 32 hours each week or, or in any given week because benefits um, are calculated on a weekly basis. And then they'd also have to be earning less than the weekly benefit amount for unemployment. That works out to be about 55% of their average weekly wage. And so it would, it would depend on how many hours they were working on that temporary basis, but it wouldn't completely take away their eligibility unless they were working the, the full time, which in Colorado is considered more than 32 hours or 32 hours or more to be specific. Okay, thank you. And then um, this, well, it looks like the last one here in this um, area. How do self-employed people that do not fall under unemployment insurance get immediate money to cover personal expenses? So in terms of that, uh, people like 1099 gig workers, um, anyone like that, first off, do not just under federal law qualify for unemployment benefits. Unfortunately, that's how unemployment was set up a long, long time ago. Um, we are recommending a few things. Number one, keep an eye on the federal legislation, what's uh, colloquially now called phase three, that's going through the Senate that will have um, money that will go to individuals, whether or not um, they're a gig worker or not. The other options that we've been saying, we, we want to make sure those people are going to their local workforce centers as well. Unfortunately, in terms of government benefits from the Department of Labor, there aren't many options, but they may qualify for other um, job opportunities. They, they also may want to look at the Department of Human Services for uh, food assistance. And then, of course, healthcare policy and financing for Medicaid to get on that. Um, unfortunately, in terms of um, unemployment insurance, though, those folks do not qualify at this time. All right, Jessica, any, um, I'm assuming by your mute button that we don't have any other questions from you. Um, anything else um, from, uh, from the larger audience? You guys have been doing a great job of putting yourselves on mute. Can you hear me? I have a question. Go for it. Okay. Obviously, there's a lot of money that's going to go through unemployment that we weren't anticipating. Can you predict what the long-term increased costs will be for businesses, say, a year from now when we have to kind of refund the unemployment um, money? Right. And, and just to give a little background, um, back during the recession, you're right, we did have to borrow money um, uh, that had interest uh, to pay for unemployment insurance benefits. We had to pay for that interest by doing a temporary surcharge on business. So just to give a little background there. At this point, um, we are predicting that our unemployment insurance trust fund will be solvent without any borrowing um, into the first quarter of 2021. Uh, we do not have an exact um, forecast because really the next two months are going to de de decide that for us. Um, we don't know, you know, are these uh, COVID layoffs temporary? Are they more permanent? Once we figure that out, then we'll be able to see the long-term impacts of the trust fund. Um, our, our immediate backup right now is interest-free federal loans. Um, because they're interest-free, they likely wouldn't um, incur an, an additional surcharge onto employers. Um, and then, you know, after that, if we have to consider bonding, that would be another question, but we, we don't know at this point. Um, and the, the solvency surcharge that employers may face, uh, we don't anticipate to kick on for a little while longer um, at this point. All right, any other questions for anybody? Oh uh, yeah, Jonathan, one just came in. Um, this one is kind of long. It says, we have furloughed 18 employees in Longmont, many of whom are PPE trained. What are you hearing about what measures will be taken if our medical facilities become overwhelmed? Also, what is Longmont's community's most urgent need? Um, at this time, I can't speak to Longmont specifically in terms of urgent needs, but um, I'll address the first question then the second. In terms of uh, medical personnel that we may need, the um, Emergency Operations Center is currently coordinating volunteers and other things like that. 
um, to be uh, registered and listed with us so that we can begin calling on those folks as, as medical centers become overwhelmed. Um, we'd encourage people to reach out to the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, as well as the Emergency Operations Center Volunteer um, Coordination um, to begin getting yourselves on those lists so that we can start um, pulling people from that. In terms of Longmont's needs, um, I can only speak to the state right now. You know, we see a lot of hiring in things like logistics, transportation, um, retail, things like that that are an uh, urgent need now. Um, and then, of course, medical personnel is on that list. Great, thank you. <laughs> Did we lose no Jonathan? Are you still with us? Oh, I'm still here. Uh, I just okay. have to move. I, you now know what the interior of my bedroom looks like, but my son needed a nap. So, um, so before we do any more questions, um, Daniel, Angela, can you stick on for the rest of this and we can let the remainder of our presenters talk and then we'll, we'll go to just a free for all with questions. Yep. We'll be on for the whole thing. Okay, great. Um, then what, what we'll do is um, I wanted to, it looks like um, Jeff, um, Jeff Cahoon, who's a, a friend of ours in uh, the labor, uh, well, in the labor world, is uh, here to talk a little bit about what's just going on for employees and employees' rights. And so I wanted to give him a couple of minutes um, to talk a little bit about uh, what is going on in that world. So. Jeff, if you're on and wanted to just share with us what's happening in, in the employee world from the perspective of em employees, please uh, jump on. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm happy to. Can you hear me? Yeah, but you do look like you're being held at an undisclosed location right now. We yeah, can I know. The, the lighting's a little odd. Um, but let me talk to the point. Um, our big concern um, from labor's point of view, and I'm speaking as president of the local labor council, AFL-CIO, uh, we've been in active consultation, obviously, since uh, uh, this thing basically broke, and uh, Governor Polis has taken very good steps, very rational steps, um, to protect workers. Uh, we are concerned that the frontline workers we represent uh, are protected, um, are provided with uh, protective gear, um, keeping in mind that union members deliver your mail, Union members service the airport. Union members are working very hard at Safeway and King Supers um, to keep supplies coming to us. Um, so union members are on the front line of this all over the place, including utility workers, of course. Uh, our big concern is that we maintain workforce levels where necessary, particularly with critical services. Um, and that we are working towards. I think we are in pretty good stead there. Um, we do want to make sure that um, we have uh, a voice on the governor's um, emergency panel, uh, headed by former mayor Federico Pena, um, to make sure frontline employees, are, as I said, have a voice in decisions as they're being made. So that's really where we're at. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, we are taking good actions in our state. Um, I think when we hear uh, Governor Polis speak, uh, we hear a rational approach to this, uh, unlike some other voices at the national level. Um, so that's where we're standing right now. Um, as we ask people to be respectful, follow proper um, uh, distancing process when we're dealing with employees, um, uh, who are doing work in this environment. Um, a lot of people are at risk and hopefully the fewest possible number will be affected directly by the uh, coronavirus. So that's kind of where we stand. All right, thank, thank you, Jeff, for sharing that. And if I ever need to do a CBS expose on anything and I need a, a, a room to shoot at my informant and I now know where to go. There you so, go. <laughs> so before we, before we go to more questions, um, what I'm gonna do is, is uh, I'm gonna hold off until everyone else has presented and then I'm gonna really make sure that we do leave a lot of time open for questions. So, um, so with that being said, I'm actually going to jump into my brief presentation, um, and then we are recording this. And so if there's anything that you miss in the slides, 
we will um, do our best to, um, well, we will uh, do our best to re-air this um, with those slides. So if you miss links or anything like that, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that that is there. So, so once again, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for, for taking the time today. Um, I wanted to thank the chamber um, once again. And um, wanted to talk a little bit, you've already heard a little bit about the federal response. And so I'm gonna move beyond um, where the federal response is since we uh, have heard from, uh, well, uh, our uh, state um, small, or excuse me, our small business administration. Um, one of the things that I will mention because it did, it did come up, um, I have spoken with Congressman Neguse as well as Congressman Perlmutter they are working on a relief package. Um, I, I shouldn't say relief package, but um, relief for our gig economy workers. And I, I do really want to say this really highlights uh, a huge component of what, um, what our economy has turned into. And there's probably some major structural changes that will need to take place as we, uh, as we move into the 21st century uh, and see more and more contract employees uh, be a larger and larger part of our economy. Um, our current UI system was never unemployment insurance system was not built for this. And so we need to create um, new protections and a new safety net um, because the, the trickle up and trickle down effects are, are potentially catastrophic otherwise. Um, but our federal partners are working exceptionally hard at, at that right now. Um, the other thing, um, and I won't, once again, won't go into this a whole lot because our SBA folks already talked about this, um, but I am going to move on to talk to you a little bit about that bigger. what we do at the um, state of Colorado. So um, one of the big challenges we have in the, in the state of Colorado right now, we are currently in a recess. Um, that means that um, the leg your legislature, while they are working hard, are not at the Capitol to keep up with the social distancing and stay at home requirements that um, have now been put in place. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, that uh, legislation has completely stopped, but it does mean hearings and votes have stopped for the time being. There was an interrogatory filed with the state Supreme Court because technically we are limited to 120 days um, every year. The question is whether those 120 days are consecutive or not. We hope to be hearing back from the state Supreme Court um, in the next week or two to see whether or not that is, um, those are consecutive days and whether right now we are literally just burning days and, and are gonna have to move quickly and, and expeditiously when we do come back after it is safe or whether or not we can take the time so we can make sure that we are preserving everyone's safety while at the same time making sure that our democracy remains strong. Uh, the other thing that I'll let you know that's going on at, at the state level right now, people can um, email me, they can call me. Uh, my, uh, I will make sure my cell phone number, if you haven't seen it in the email already, um, is 303-875-4727. I'll say it one more time, 303-875-4727. You can text, you can call. My office staff is working remotely um, almost around the clock right now, um, and so my thanks to them. You can also email me, rep singer, rep like representative, singer like the music, uh, at um, gmail.com. That will go to my state legislative account. And we will get you in touch with either the state, local, or federal agency that needs assistance, or if you're working on a policy front, we will do that. I did want to respond to the question uh, about a moratorium on evictions and um, foreclosures. The uh, state attorney general, Phil Weiser, has asked the courts to put a halt on those cases uh, for the time being. Um, that is uh, you know, not anything that is guaranteed. And so we are currently looking legislatively to see what we can do within the state government. Um, that we're looking at where the state and federal government overlap on that to make sure that we're doing things legally. And we have laws that, that will actually protect people. Um, as someone who is a renter, I definitely understand the fear and the concern that a lot of people have right now. And, um, and this, this is affecting um, not just people on the ground, but this is affecting your lawmakers as well. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is the state budget. Uh, we are required to balance our budget every year. Uh, what that means is that 
uh, in, in an era where um, we were looking at a potential uh, tax refund or Tabor refund of almost um, 300, um, yeah, we were looking at about $300 million tax refund. Right now, the, the state coffers have probably shrunk um, by about a billion dollars. So we are looking at about hundreds of millions of dollars in cuts to services potentially, unless federal aid comes down quickly. So um, no new programs will likely take effect without federal assistance at this point. Uh, we are, and we were really prevailing on our congressional delegation to help carry us in this really challenging time. Uh, the state cannot print its own money and we do have to maintain a balanced budget by constitutional amendment. So uh, we are using our bully pulpit as loudly as possible. And once again, looking at every legal angle to make sure that we can protect people who are either in foreclosure, um, rent, um, and uh, the last thing that I'll mention on that side of things is I am having individual conversations with banks, and I can say that many, many of our banks have agreed to um, either do forbearances or um, even up to 90 days of, of um, um, uh, loan forgiveness. Um, those are individual and not, uh, not done on more than a case-by-case -case basis in many cases. But if you do reach out to me, I already got one question in, in the comments here. Um, if you do reach out to me, I can get you in touch with those banks and oftentimes they are willing to work with you on those things. Uh, as well, if you are struggling right now, um, I wanna share with you a few things. Um, the Our Center has been remarkably helpful. Um, we also, I have a link up here for the Jeffco Action Center as well as uh, local food banks, the Food Bank of the Rockies. Um, has, I have a link up there and a hotline number up there as well. Um, and then if you need to reach out to, um, actually I'm going to mention this right now, if you are grocery shopping for yourself right now and you see a little WIC sticker, Women, Infants, and Children, uh, WIC programs are uh, specifically for women, infants, and children. Uh, women who do qualify for WIC. Um, aren't able to use their WIC dollars for things other than what um, has been listed um, on the grocery shelves for them. So this is peanut butter, eggs, milk, uh, different things like that. So for those of you who are panicked, please don't hoard. Um, I want you to think about those folks for a second and think about the fact that they, um, if they don't uh, purchase WIC food, they may not be purchasing food at all for themselves or for their kids right now. Take, get what you need, buy what you need, but uh, please don't, don't go beyond that. Um, please also don't hesitate to keep up on Twitter and on Facebook, the Department of Labor, um, the Office of Emergency Management, the Department of Public Health, all have uh, very frequently updated social media channels that you can follow. Uh, things may be changing sometimes by the minute. Um, also, if you are a veteran, um, I have a link there at the bottom. Uh, of this slide that talks about your ability to access uh, VA resources. So please, um, once again, don't forget to reach out. Um, if you need assistance and live in Boulder County, you can call the Boulder County uh, number, 303-441-1000. Um, you can also go onto the Boulder County website for food assistance. Workforce development centers, if you're out of work, um, are operating remotely now. So if you need assistance with that, um, they are out there um, and they are not just helping people on public assistance like food stamps and TANF, but um, anyone who's in need of a job. Uh, you know, the good news is we are seeing grocery stores hiring more and more people right now. Uh, last, I just wanted to share some, some links here on some of the local opportunities you have. The Colorado Small Business Development Center, Downtown Longmont, uh, Visit Longmont and the Longmont Chamber all have resources up there on their websites. So uh, please don't hesitate to Google them or, or use the links as I've listed below. Uh, but, uh, and l last, last but not least, um, what I will uh, share is that uh, for those of you who are just feeling personally overwhelmed right now, uh, that is completely understandable. Uh, I think all of us are, are feeling some level of that right now. Um, I'm going to be doing another town hall Sunday afternoon. I'll be posting a link to that as well. Um, it'll be Sunday from 3 to 4.30, and we're specifically going to be focused on mental health. Um, we can't take care of our kids if we can't take care of ourselves, folks. 
So, um, so I, I will have some leading experts there to walk you through some things about resources, but for anyone who needs to talk, we wanna make sure you have the resources out there. Um, so I'm gonna take a look at, um, or Jessica, you've been probably looking at some questions. Have I forgotten any of our presenters? I don't Good. think so. Wow, okay, first thing I haven't forgotten all day. Um, <laughs> Jessica, how are we looking on questions here? Yeah. So actually, um, if, if everybody is okay, we would like to open things up with the, the Q&A portion now. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. And I'm actually grouped a couple of them. Um, they have to do with, in regards to tenants and um, renting issues. So I guess maybe let's tackle those first. There was one in the comments, um, it said, I am a commercial property owner and my tenants are asking for rent relief and I'm not sure how I can assist them when the banking institutions have not provided any borrower relief. Tackle that one. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take a stab at it and then if other folks wanna jump in, feel free to, feel free to do that. Um, so uh, I won't repeat anything, but just looking at what our, um, our attorney general has already done in, in terms of asking our courts for, for a stay on those court cases, that's, a, that's the beginning. Um, we'll have to look and see what we're doing through our federal relief package as well, because uh, there um, ideally will be some strings attached. So if you as a landlord are getting relief or forbearance, uh, it should be extended to tenants as well. Um, I'll just say, um, since the question has come up uh, more than once, uh, one of the legal challenges that we may be facing with, with just uh, a straight up um, rent relief program where we could say to people, skip out on your rent, for lack of a better term, um, the, if we were to solely simply legalize that, we'd probably be looking at other court cases around uh, a takings issue. And so uh, when I say we're looking at every legal option to protect people, we want to make sure that people are, are, are made whole uh, because a lot of our landlords um, who are out there are they themselves small businesses and, and struggling. A lot of conversations are happening though between tenants and landlords right now. Um, and what I would recommend is that um, until we can get back to the capital where we can actually create um, some blanket rules around this, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we will find ways uh, to uh, make this work on a on a case by case basis. And like I said, a lot of banks have been very forgiving um, uh, in trying to find out ways to do this. And and ultimately, I'll just say from from a policy standpoint, yes, you know, for the next thirty to ninety days, we should be looking at some moratorium on both mortgages and and um, rentals, given the fact that the the economy is not um, is not up and running the way it should uh, would be um, under normal circumstances. I don't know if anyone else has any other thoughts though. And representative, this is Daniel with the Department of Labor. We're also recommending that landlords and tenants both uh, keep open lines of communication with the Department of Local Affairs uh, Division of Housing. They are working on trying to figure out what we can do administratively around rent relief um, and of the such. So uh, we definitely recommend you guys reaching out to them as well. Okay, so um, moving on, I have another question. Um, this was in the comments as well. It says, I'm overwhelmed with information. I would, like to, I would like reassurance from my significant other that landscaping is okay to continue to do as long as all safety measures are being taken. This is a good question. And um, I know um, if you live in Boulder County um, or actually, close to two and a half million folks now across uh, the front range. There have been different stay at home orders. I don't know if landscaping is being considered an essential service right now. And so this is something um, I'm happy to take this one offline and, and get you a better answer on that. Um, given that in all likelihood, there, there are some social distancing components to landscaping. That's not um, as long as you've got workers who are not in close proximity to each other and we're protecting basic health, I think there's an opportunity there to talk to our local public health department um, and we'll, we'll make sure to bring them on in future conferences. Great. 
Thank you. Um, another one, it pertains to Medicaid. Um, is Medicaid protected by statute? If BHMCOs abandon ship through bankruptcy, will HCPF be prepared to work with BH provider? Who doesn't love alphabet soup? Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna actually say what those acronyms are, and then we can go straight straight into what that is. And so, um, so um, if if Medicaid is not able, so HCPF is Healthcare Policy and Finance. HICPUF is um, is our um, Medicaid department in Colorado. Um, so um, if our managed care organizations or MCOs um, are in behavioral health, abandon ship through bankruptcy, will healthcare policy and finance be able to respond? I, I would say that the short answer is that um, I'm working with the Office of Behavioral Health um, as well as our department, our Medicaid department to look at, at those different um, components. Right now, the answer is if everyone went belly up today, the short answer would be no. Um, but that's something that we'll be covering in our next um, town hall meeting that's coming up uh, on Sunday. Great, thank you. Um, and the last one here in the chat is I'm in construction and we are starting to see impacts in some jur jurisdictions delaying building permits, inspections, and planning review. Is there thought to getting those departments more flexibility into being able to continue doing their jobs to not create new construction slowdown. All right, I was waiting for someone else to take that one, but I'm gonna try and juggle that one as best as possible. So, so building permits are conducted through local governments. Um, so that would be, and this is honestly very helpful. We'll, we'll make sure to have our city and county local government officials on uh, the next time we do a conference. Uh, but the, the short answer is these would be decisions made by your local jurisdiction. Um, we are a local control state, and this is a really good question. Um, I know our planning departments are, are oftentimes right now working remotely, which obviously creates some, some slowdown there. Um, what I would also say is, is building permits are subject to public review. And so uh, we have uh, been able to make sure that uh, city councils can meet remotely, our school boards can meet remotely. We just passed legislation for school boards actually um, about a week before we recessed. And um, so when it comes to those public components, we wanna make sure that that's still part of our process. Um, if it has an immediate life, health or safety component to it. Um, so if you are building, building or renovating a hospital wing or something for a medical clinic, I think we do need to look at exceptions for that. Um, and I can sit, speak very boldly because I'm not a local government official right now. <laughs> so I can't, um, I can't say yes and I also can't say no to these things. But what I can do, um, and I see that's from Andy. Um, Andy, if you want to email me at ressinger at gmail.com um, and there's a, if there's a specific or a set of jurisdictions, what I can do is I can get you in touch with those planning departments and also I work with the um, construction trades. And so we can find a way to see whether or not there's a good template that we can be following so we're not re recreating the wheel every time. Great, thank you. Um, another one for you, uh, it looks like for uh, CDLE, for UI denials for independent contract status, what is the plan to ensure that they are not misclassified? How is that determined? Yeah, that's a really good question. So if you feel that um, you are not an independent contractor and you are an employee, then we do encourage you to file a claim. Um, our division has an, a whole audits team uh, that's dedicated to figuring out if an employee is an independent contractor or not, and they will reclassify you um, and then fine an employer if they believe that that is the case. Um, so we encourage you to file the claim, and if you feel that you have been misclassified, um, that's something that we can handle um, on our side. That is something that we do quite a bit, in fact. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Any specific resources for the small business immigrant community you recommend? Absolutely. So um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a little bit out there, and if Department of Labor wants to throw something in there as well, they can. Um, and so I, 
I will um, say that I just spoke with our, our staff just spoke with the Latino Chamber of Commerce here in Longmont. Uh, we are working on, first of all, getting translation services set up for our next town hall meeting. Uh, the second thing is that we are looking into the legality of uh, people who have their um, deferred action status, their DACA status, to be able to get access um, to basic services. Um, and legislatively, we were trying to actually create new pathways and new solutions even before um, the COVID crisis um, came up uh, on top of us. And so um, I'm going to be looking through the federal relief packages and see if there's, there's additional resources out there. Um, as as we know, um, in our you know whether it's our construction industry, our restaurant industry, you name it, um, our our population of folks, whether they are uh, documented, undocumented, um, have their green cards or not, um, they are a huge backbone of our economy, and and I'm working to find ways to to address that. Daniel, I don't know if you have anything specific at the Department of Labor as it relates to, to uh, deferred action. Or So in terms of uh, DACA, we have determined that DACA recipients um, are eligible for UI, so that's a big win for us. Um, we are, so we have on our staff uh, Kit Tainter, she's the uh, Senior Advisor for New American Integration uh, in the Governor's Office. She's been working on compiling those kind of resource documents. Um, she's been pretty focused toward workers, though I know she is moving to small businesses to figure out where those resources are. I'd love to get that question. Um, if you can get it through Representative Singer to us, I'd love to connect you with her. I think she'd be a good resource. Uh, the other resource that I'll just throw out there, um, not to put more on, on our community nonprofits, but if you uh, reach out to um, El Comite, El Comite de Longmont, um, they have been very helpful in a number of circumstances right now. I'm also working with the Colorado Immigrant Rights Coalition on uh, a package of issues to see if they need to be addressed administratively or legislatively. So this is a really relevant question, uh, especially here in Longmont, and, and something that we'll, we'll get you a better answer to. All right, thank you. So here is a question that came through um, an email. It says, for employees that are working for, for an essential company, do we need a form for transportation, such as a letter from our employer? How is the county going to know who is traveling for essential reasons and who isn't? Another good question, and this is, this is developing as, as time moves on. Um, Denver has put into place uh, a number of um, restrictions that are, um, you know, uh, very strong. Um, so people are potentially facing, you know, $999 fines if, if they're violating the stay at home order. Um, what I have seen, and, and I'll get further clarification on this, and in my conversations with local law enforcement, is really this is in the first real round is to be informative to people, to encourage them to stay at home. Um, but if they are, you know, going to an essential service or taking part in an essential service, um, that is something that is still necessary and still needs to happen. So, um, you know, what I, what I would recommend right now, if, you know, if you are hospital staff, if you're an employee of a grocery store, um, you know, what I would suggest is, you know, not hesitating to have your employee ID with you. Um, my guess is really this is going to be, a, a, unless we see droves of people coming out and violating um, the stay at home orders right now, you're probably not going to be seeing those strong actions taking place where, where people will be potentially looking at, at fines or other corrective actions. Um, but once again, I'll work to get you better answers on that as well. Great, thank you. We have a whole oh, list of questions oh, coming in. Oh, is there anybody else? Jessica, sorry to interrupt. Um, we have someone on the line from RTD. Um, so, um, Cole, if you want to talk a little bit about what's happening in our RTD world right now, to use a technical term and, and, and to provide some informa background information, uh, feel free to jump in. Hey, thank you for uh, taking my call. Uh, I'm just giving you a quick update on RTD. Um, you know, our drivers were all still out there, and, uh, you know, we're trying to do our best to serve the public. Uh, RTD was a little behind the curve in, um, you know, trying to protect their drivers. But uh, I think uh, 
what the governor's urging. Um, they're starting to see the light. Um, so we, we've been driving scared because we contact, uh, you know, hundreds of people on a daily basis. Um, I don't know if you're aware of, but last night, RTD passed an emergency schedule change where about 40% of services will be reduced, mostly in uh, service intervals, like from 15 minutes to 30 minutes, which is, you know, pretty acceptable based on, on our current load. However, there were some routes that uh, were completely eliminated, and uh, there were some some of the routes, you know, they just took the big axe, you know, the, the simple axe was just changing us to a Saturday-type schedule, and they are adjusting some routes to where they will start earlier than they would on a normal Saturday on the core trunk routes, and but some routes starting late, and that could have some impact on the ability of our of our labor force to get to work in those early hour mornings or to finish up at the late hour evenings, I mean, late evening hour. <laughs> and uh, RTD has, uh, on the upside, RTD being as short-handed as they were, has committed to keeping all the employees um, on staff. The contractors um, were not in as bad a shape as uh, the district itself. And uh, it's still undecided. This just started all last night, so it's still undecided as to the best way to proceed on that. Um, do you have any questions about RTD? Any RTD questions? I, I Are have they one. still collecting? Oh. Go ahead. Are they still collecting fares at the fare box? Have they uh, uh, roped off the driver's area um, to help protect uh, drivers? Well, that was, um, in other places they are doing that, where they are um, doing backdoor entry only and um, roping off a, you know, a seats next to the driver. In Longmont, this is a particularly bad issue because on the smaller type buses, the passengers sit very close. RTD has a a little bit of a pro. I mean, a little bit. They say yes, we're going to rope them off. No, we're not going to rope them off. But in other places, um, they've also done away with the fare collection, uh, just as a safety you know safety measure because the fare box is, you know, at the side of the driver. But he has not uh, taken those steps yet that other places in the country have. Thank you. Um, I had a question on Accessoride. Um, have they drastically reduced their routes as well? Um, Accessoride is not is not a fixed route service. Um, they have not reduced, so there's no route to be reduced. However, they are experiencing, with you know, with the lockdown, they have been experiencing a greatly reduced number of calls, and that could have the impact later. Okay, thank you. Anything else on RTD before we jump back to Jessica with questions? All right, Jessica, anything else? Yep, I have a couple more. Um, one, let's see. This came through a, a text. It says, how long, do we have, how long do we have to attempt to hold on before we will see any aid from my, for my SNAP visit? Did you hear that? Why don't we try and repeat that? I heard some background noise on that yeah, one. Yeah, so. I did too. Okay. So it says, how long do we have to attempt to hold on before we will see any aid for my SNAP business? So I'm assuming by SNAP business, we're talking about uh, supplemental nutritional assistance program. Is that correct? Or is this something different? I believe so. I think that's what they're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I will do is I, I will work to, uh, I, I I wish I could just tell you it's coming tomorrow. I know that they're moving with all due haste and are, are intending to get these, um, you know, assistance checks out very quickly. Um, once again, people can can email me, repsinger at gmail.com 
I wish I had all the answers today. Um, and but part of the reason we're doing this is to get the uh, get the questions out there so we can make sure we can answer these questions as as um, as effectively and accurately as possible. Great. And then one more came through text. Um, what are we going to do to help the tourism and travel industry here? All right. Oh, and I see it was a small business, not SNAP. So uh, on, on that last question. So um, so for, for the small business question, I would certainly recommend um, let, let we, uh, the, those re that relief package, assuming it's passed, um, which, which all indications are that it will happen later tonight, is the idea is to be getting checks out there as quickly as possible. I'm hearing, and this is rumor, which I know is dangerous in a pandemic, um, with, within about a week. Um, I'm an optimist as well, which is maybe also dangerous in a pandemic. So, um, so in terms of what we're doing for our tourist industry, I, mean, I, I think what, what I will say, um, actually, can, can we get Department of Labor to chime in a little bit on uh, what we're doing for seasonal employees before I go into what I was going to talk about? Yeah, um, we, seasonal employees, as you guys know, generally will qualify for unemployment benefits. Um, those employers are paying into the unemployment trust fund for their wages. So that's, that's number one. Um, we're trying to get more workforce center assistance to those folks, but with um, the mountain communities being um, relatively more heavier hit than uh, the metro area with the COVID virus, it's, it's been a little bit more difficult, but that's definitely one of our um, central focuses right now on uh, for our employment and training workforce development folks. All right. Um, so um, the other thing is I am talking to the Office of International Development or Economic Development and International Trade. I'm, um, I'm actually hopefully hearing from them by the end of the week on that. So in terms of what that means, <clears throat> excuse me, businesses is, um, you know, Still up in the air for me, but I, I will work to get you a better answer on that one. Um, also, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Small Business Administration. Once again, um, they are out there as a resource uh, for folks right now. And um, there, there are loans that are being made available right now. And they're even talking about um, having some loan forgiveness um, through that program, and especially um, low interest rates and, and very favorable rates um, over a 30 year payback as we heard earlier in the conference um, in the conference call but once again if we if there are specific um, issues with your specific business please don't hesitate to reach out rep singer at gmail all great thank you okay we're getting down um here's one and I hope I have this right. Um, are there plans for assisting those who work in the gig economy? They are not eligible for unemployment insurance or able to handle the massive paperwork of an SBA loan. So if, if you are, all right, well, <clears throat> I gave out my cell phone number and that obviously works. So I'm gonna not look at my cell phone while I answer this question. But um, so once again, for, for gig economy, for independent contractors, um, <clears throat> we are asking the federal government for assistance with that right now. Um, our current unemployment insurance program was uh, not set up for gig economy workers. They do not pay into that. Um, and so that has been a, a huge challenge right now. Um, that being said, with the federal relief packages, my understanding is that part of that will include um, assistance for contract workers, folks in our, our, our gig economy. Um, and, and this is, you know, once again, another unfortunate but important opportunity to talk about what we can do in the future to make sure that folks in, in our contract employee world um, are better planned for and taken care of in, in the future because this has is, this is really highlighted the importance of that. Um, if there's an immediate need, please, once again, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we will try and find a way either through food assistance, rent assistance, um, whatever it is, um, to find a way to um, support folks in the short term while we are um, trying to create a better long-term um, relief uh, system. Yeah, and to add on to that just real briefly, um, 
I wanted to also bring up that keep in mind workforce centers are ready to work with anyone. They don't need to be employees or not. Um, they can be an independent contractor and they can work with them. We're also trying to um, apply with the U.S. Department of Labor for um, some emergency grants that they're putting out for states um, to hopefully get money in for uh, retraining and, and those kinds of things for gig workers as well. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, it looks like we have two more. Uh, one from an email, it says, what is the most pressing need at the state level right now and how can we as concerned Coloradoans help? Excellent question. Um, and, and Daniel, I'll let you jump in too if you've got some things. I, I would say really right now, uh, the number one thing that we're gonna have to figure out is how we're gonna navigate a potential billion dollars in cuts. Um, and these are going to be very tough choices that we're going to have to make. Uh, we are using our bully pulpit to the federal government to say, this is, you know, if, if you thought the 2013 flood was bad, um, this is worse. This is going to be harder. Um, but we are literally, almost literally all in the same boat at this time. So what I would suggest is really finding a way that we can all work together um, to amplify that voice up to our federal partners to say, uh, we do need relief dollars. We need them to come in quickly. And we need to be able to make sure that the state can fine tune those relief dollars to the needs within our specific communities, not just our specific state, um, but within our specific communities. Um, I've, I've seen money coming down through community development block grant or proposals for money coming down through community development block grants. But um, the number one thing that we're going to have to figure out as a legislature is when we can come back, when it's safe to come back, how we're able to meet, if we're able to meet, and how we're able to meet remotely if we cannot uh, physically be back there. And, um, and ultimately, um, you know, what you can do to help, uh, I will um, share, share a number of links with folks, but um, if, if you can go to the covid19.colorado.gov page, I'm showing it on the presentation right now, um, there are ways that you can um, help. And um, if you go to helpcoloradonow.org, um, Help Colorado Now uh, will actually line you up with individual community organizations. So um, there's a lot um, that needs to be done. How you can specifically help um, really depends on what your abilities are. I'm getting emails from people who are trying to figure out where they can get medical equipment because they have it. If you have a specific need or have a specific strength that you think um, our state could use, once again, just don't hesitate to reach out. Um, let me know. And, and we're talking to our state, local, um, and federal partners um, all, all the time, every day. Yeah, and this is Daniel. Just to add to that, helpcoloradonow.org, you can sign up to volunteer. You can sign up to donate, whatever your abilities are. Um, we'll match you with with work that needs to be done right now. Um, and then also, of course, vitalent.org to uh, if you're willing to donate blood, um, that's in high demand right now. Um, you can donate by community um, to keep that there. Uh, and then um, in terms of the long term, yeah, we, we're here at the Department of Labor. We're just looking to see what, what kind of long term impacts this will have on the economy. Um, it may just be a short term impact. It may be that the economy starts right up and we move along. Um, but chances are it could be a, a longer term impact that we need to um, invest in our workforce and look for different opportunities there. All right, anything else, Jessica? Um, it looks like uh, somebody had a question if you could publish the link for your Sunday's town hall again, if you could announce that or publish that somewhere, that would be great. Absolutely, we'll, we'll, we'll get the link published um, on, on my Facebook page and we'll send it out in an email. If you don't get my emails, once again, you can reach out to me and I'll make sure uh, we capture that. You can also type in your email address in the chat box there. We'll make sure to capture that and put you on our list. Uh, and it'll be, once again, conducted through Zoom. So hopefully everyone um, is, is familiar with the platform now. I think, um, I think that's the end of our questions. Um, there is a, it looks like in the group chat, uh, Anna Finkelstein, is it Steen? Um, just put 
Um, another resource for a uh, center for people with disabilities. So um, if you guys have a chance, it's kind of lengthy, so get a chance to look at that. Anybody else have any questions on the phone? I had one that I sent in that we didn't get to. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes. So um, as you know, Boulder County property taxes are very high and they're actually my highest expense. I own two commercial buildings. Is there any discussion about uh, postponing? Like I paid the first half of the property taxes, the second half's due in June. Is there any discussion about postponing that without penalty to pay those after the June deadline? So um, once again, I'll, I'll put this out there, but I'll also you know, reach out to our local partners and the Division of Property Taxation on this one as well. Um, you know, uh, I know the IRS has, has put a delay on a receipt of taxes right now. Um, and I've asked the state of Colorado to look at mirroring that delay for, um, for state taxes. Um, I, I think that, you know, this is a good time, as, as good a time as any to talk about how we do that and how quickly that happens. Um, I, it's something I completely agree with you on though. And um, I haven't gotten that many contacts about it, but I imagine I will as we get closer and closer to the deadline. And so that's something I'll, I'll get to work on. And if you've got ideas about sure. what that would look like and, and how we could proceed, um, definitely let me know. Um, there's, there's a lot of trickle down effects that honestly, uh, a lot of people need to take into consideration, even how the senior tax work off program might work in a situation where we have a, a stay at home order. So, um, so a lot to be, a lot to be told on that one. And, um, you know, once again, if you email me, I will get back with you with a, a better, more complete answer than what I've given you right now. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Any other questions? If there's nothing else for the time being, um, I know we, we basically budgeted one to two, one to two thirty for this. I want to thank everyone for, for being on um, as long as they have. Um, we're going to keep doing these as long as you keep thinking they're valuable. I know that we've got more questions than we do answers. And so I'll be getting back to work to get you answers to those questions as quickly as possible. I, I do want to thank the Chamber of Commerce uh, once again, um, and all of our speakers for just taking the time right now to, um, to participate in this, because the only way that we're gonna figure this out is, is by figuring this out together. And uh, I feel the pressure, uh, and I know all of you do too. And, and I, I hope that we can light a fire under our federal government to get those relief packages through quickly and to the people who need it the most as quickly as possible. Um, if anyone else has any wrap up comments that they wanna make from our, our presenters group, um, feel free to make them now, but otherwise, once again, I, I just want to thank you all for your time, and we're going to do everything we can to get um, help to the people who need it the most, the fastest. All right. Well, um, once again, repsinger at gmail.com or 303-875-4727. You can text. That's probably a little faster than calling right now. 303-875-4727, repsinger at gmail.com. And uh, once again, uh, I can't thank you enough for just taking the time today. And we'll get everyone some answers and, and find a way to move forward that will hopefully help our entire community. I agree. Everybody be safe and be healthy. And like you said, we will get through this together. <laughs>